Hi, I'm Ashley Adamson, and I'm going to go into the three pillars of approaches and philosophies of working with beauty standards in the real world. Um, you know, like beauty standards kind of affect all of us, and how's it affecting you? How does it affect your world, how you see things, what kind of choices you make, your own sense of confidence and self-value, and also like uh, how it affects your internal world as well as the external world. We're gonna dive into three different approaches that I would say and um, kind of dissect each one in a way that it may hopefully help you formulate more narratives of how you engage the beauty standards that we're all kind of sub um, subjected to. This is super important, especially if you don't feel like you're attractive enough or that you don't value yourself enough. There are really important nuggets in here. So we're gonna dive into that today. Also, thank you to my Patreon supporters for supporting me. And before we get into this, if you like watching personal growth development videos with a trans lens on things, then that's my videos. I post about three weeks, so there's plenty of juicy stuff to dive into. Um, so for today, we're talking about the three main pillars of like beauty standards. Now these are, oh, these are in a sense simplified than the complexity that there actually is. And that's because in a 10 minute video, to model the complexity across all spectrums becomes way too difficult. So I'm gonna simplify just for this video, the three main pillars as I see it of approaching beauty standards. So the first one is the most obvious one. Uh, beauty standards, yes, conformity. That is what conf conformity is. It just says these are the beauty standards. Yes, we'll stick to these and we'll just kind of keep going with that. So this is great because it makes it easy to know what plane you're communicating on. Like you, if you're a woman, you wear makeup, you wear a certain dress, you look a certain way, you sound a certain way, and um, you just kind of kick, you, you kick the can along of personal development and say, I don't need to process any of this kind of stuff. I'll just kind of keep going with whatever the fashion magazines are selling me and, and what have you. Um, the downside of this is while it can make it easier to be accepted and seen in the way that you want to be seen, it also means that it can be expensive. Uh, it's a highly fragile place to be because now you're placing all of your um, beauty on the standards that are dictated by an industry that um, profits off of your insecurity and in creating new images that are ultimately going to be unattainable, uh, especially with the Instagram models who Photoshop their appearances and the way that people have makeup used in, in celebrities and all of that. It's just like the standards and the beauty is just, un, if it's unattainable unless you have a whole production around you. And there are real women that um, you see out there who kind of are completely committed to this path. So much so that it kind of sounds like it's their full-time job, um, you know, doing their nails, getting their hair done, doing this, getting the Botox, all of these things like stacked on just being the most beautiful person. And yes, it brings them some value, but ultimately this is a fragile stance. Um, I'll make that case because um, what value do you bring to the table besides your beauty? If you don't really have a sense of intelligence or a sense of um, uh, creating value beyond your appearance, it's, it's just kind of like, it's, it's gonna shatter at some point because you're gonna get older. Uh, and if you're conforming to beauty standards, then uh, being older is not an attractive thing. So that's the conformist perspective. The deconstructionist and reconstructionist perspective is something that says no to beauty standards and, and I think this stance is, um, it's really good to have this stance in society because we're talking about saying, hey, we see the beauty standards and that these beauty standards don't are not realistic and they're not enabling healthy bodies. They're not enabling healthy minds and ultimately a healthy society. So let's deconstruct that. Let's, let's embrace different forms of things that have been categorically uh, placed in the unattractive category. You see this with people that are embracing being overweight. You see this with people who are non-binary. I was also non-binary and uh, that was definitely something that I was embracing. Uh, you know, like the people that look um, very feminine but have a beard um, or um, 
the other way around, look masculine, but have some kind of feminine appearance as well. Uh, this is really an important um, movement to have because it helps us recalibrate the widely distributed conformist beauty standard, which has been dominant through our ideological structures uh, over the past 100 years because of the way that the media has uh, basically been globalized and then hyper delivered through Instagram and TikTok and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I like this narrative. I like that it exists, but I don't find it to be the most convenient one for me because the downsides of this is that you're sort of like an active participant in being an activist, in continuing to deconstruct beauty standards, to continue to, to talk about it in public spaces, to push on it, and to also feel the oppositional effects of people that don't like the fact that you're not conforming to standards, um, or maybe even being attacked. I could not ever go outside dressed as a woman and to grow out my hair and just be like to feel how that the disgust people would look at me because I remember the amount of disgust that I got when I was in Eastern Europe being very outwardly non-binary. It's just like it, it takes a lot of energy. It feels energetically abusive from other people that really don't like you. And uh, it kind of makes you polarizing in a way that I feel is not the battle that I want to fight. We only have, like you only have so much energy in your day, you only have so much energy in your life to expend on things. Do you wanna to commit to being the fighter and the activist around beauty standards? Are there other things you wanna to commit to? Like having a life that where it supports you in being happy, uh, having a career, having a family, doing something big and meaningful that isn't related to beauty standards? Like where, are you in terms of how you want to create into this world? And for me, I have decided not to be in the deconstructionist and reconstructionist world. When I was non-binary, I got misgendered all the time and it just, it made me, uh, it, it's kind of like disassociative with my pronouns because it just happened so much. But once I transitioned as, into being a, a binary woman and adhering to the more conformist visuals. I was gendered correctly, I was more accepted, it was more wide of a way for me to get in and connect with people around me, which was perfect, it was great. It made my life a lot easier and it helped me focus on other things. So this is the next kind of pillar or stance on beauty standards, which is what I call the evolutionist perspective. The evolutionist perspective is sort of saying, yes, beauty standards, and. So like, what is that and? The and is like, what are all the additionals on top of that? It's, and I understand that these beauty standards are constructed, and I understand that I can have more value than my appearance, and I understand that I can change and shift this a little bit. And this is kind of the place where I find to be the most flexible because you can take beauty standards, you can acknowledge beauty standards, you can work with them in a way where people can acknowledge and more widely accept you. Uh, and at the same time, you don't have to be an activist around beauty. And it gives you the opportunity to also deconstruct in smaller ways and find ways in which you can find more value. Now, I know some of you may be looking at me and saying, what does she know? Because she looks great. She's very attractive. And, um, you know, if you're attractive, it's a lot easier to, um, to just be accepted. And thank you for thinking that first of all, because just for you to see me as beautiful and attractive is a huge compliment. That's not how I've seen myself for most of my life. And I've worked a lot on that more recently in the past year and a half. Uh, I've always felt ugly, I've always felt unattractive, and I think it's also because my face does not conform to beauty standards, my appearance, being a half Asian person, I have facial flaws, I have a lot of um, different things that have made me feel dysphoric about my face, and I've also had surgery, so um, there have been also visual improvements. But I've not felt attractive until the past year and a half, um, and it's it's been a lot of personal development work. But with that kind of that aside there, I want to move back into this evolutionist perspective. I think it's kind of like 
It's taking these conformist ideals and picking and choosing what fits for you while simultaneously acknowledging that these beauty standards are things that you're adhering to and that ultimately they are not going to be tied to your self-value in who you are. To say, I want to look attractive based on the conformist views, but I do not tie myself to the value that is created in, in looking a certain way. If I look attractive and I look good, that's great, but I do not tie my value to that appearance. Because if I do tie my value to that appearance, then I believe and I conform to that structure. And then you buy into the beauty is value and therefore if you're not beautiful, then you're not valued. If you put on makeup, you feel great, but then if you take off your makeup, then you don't feel as great because you don't look as attractive. It's this kind of catch 22. And so when I put on makeup and I do make myself look great, I also acknowledge that I'm engaging in this practice of conformity and that it's a double-edged sword that I kind of try to work on dodging by saying I don't attach that much value to how I look. Now, I do also have a stance that says, hey, like as a trans woman who's 35 and I only transitioned three and a half, almost four years ago, I have not had a lot of time to experience being a woman of youth. And while I acknowledge that age and attractiveness should not be tied together in a societal structure that still is largely dominated by the hegemonic structures of beauty standards produced by beauty industry, I want to engage in the world in a way where I can play and experience things that I might not be able to do when I'm older. And so I feel that I, I don't want to say I've lost, but I've said as an older trans woman, I haven't had, you know, zero to um, 32 being a woman. I never really had my teenage years as a woman, never had my twenties as a woman. So what I will do instead is I'll use other mechanisms to compensate for the fact that I don't have that youth that I could have had. And um, one of those ways is leveraging resources. I am a single trans woman who ha is a self-taught designer in tech and I can use some of the resources that I have acquired through my hard work and teaching myself how to get into tech and be a designer to leverage my resources that I get there into making myself appear younger and um, look more attractive. And so for me, that was facial feminization, that was breast surgery. Um, and it's also, I think, other things such as uh, uh, procedures that will make me look younger in the future. I don't know what those are. I haven't done the, that research, but I think when you go down the surgery path, which is kind of like this weird path for a lot of trans people because it can become an infinite path. I have to know where the boundaries are and what my principles are engaging in the surgery path because I don't wanna be tied to surgery as an outcome to solve any of my problems. What I want is I want to use surgery as a, an additive to help make my life better. So that's kind of like my own personal philosophy around that. Um, thank you for joining me in this video. I hope that it's been helpful in thinking about like where do you stand and how do you want to experience your, yourself in this world of beauty standards. If you're also um, feeling kind of like doubtful of valuing, your, valuing yourself, I also have another video that's um, gonna come out or has already come out, which is about three tips to value yourself. Thanks to all my Patreon supporters. And if you'd like to read my transition book, it's on my website. I'll see you in another video soon. Bye.